Hello everyone. This is a response to a video by Logos Apologia called Resurrection Challenge Can You Account for the Evidence? I put a link to the video in the description box if you want to check it out. In his video, Logos Apologia claims that the resurrection of Jesus is the most reasonable conclusion to five facts that he states are accepted by virtually every scholar. The five facts are Jesus really died. The disciples believed they saw the risen Jesus, the conversion of the persecutor Paul, the conversion of the skeptic James, and the empty tomb. Even though I don't personally accept all of these five facts, for the sake of this video, I will concede them all. The implication from Logos Apologia is that the only way to reasonably deny the resurrection of Jesus is to dispute one or more of the facts he presents. However, I hope to demonstrate that, even if one was to accept all of the items as facts, a more reasonable conclusion would be that Jesus did not rise from the dead. I might also note that Logos Apologia expects one hypothesis to address all of the facts he listed. However, I believe that, although the five facts may be related, they don't all need to be explained by one event. One event may have caused a chain reaction. The first item I'd like to address in Logos Apologia's argument is Fact 5, the empty tomb. The resurrection hypothesis does provide an explanation for the empty tomb, but is it the most plausible? The answer is a resounding no. The most plausible explanation for an empty tomb is a natural one, such as the body was removed by Joseph of Arimathea or someone else. The main objection offered by pro-resurrection apologists is to say that there were guards posted at the tomb which would have prevented the unwanted removal of Jesus' body. But what evidence is there to support the claim that a guard was posted at the tomb? The only evidence I can find is in the Gospel of Matthew. The other Gospels interestingly leave this detail out. Now why would that be? I believe the most likely explanation is that the story was a fabrication by the writer of Matthew as an apologetic to answer the allegation that the disciples stole the body of Jesus. The second item I'd like to address is fact two, the sightings of Jesus after his death. To most people this offers the greatest evidence for a resurrected Jesus. However, is it the most plausible explanation? Again. I have to answer no. Studies have shown that our perception is affected by many types of bias. One type is expectation. In other words, we can perceive exactly what we expect to perceive regardless of what is real. This is why scientists in Nazi Germany thought they could see non-existent physical differences between the blood particles of Jews and those of Aryans. Another type of bias that can affect our perception is something called false memory. We can often remember things that have been told to us, and even our own fantasies, as our own very real experiences. A third bias that affects our perception is availability error or confirmation bias. This bias causes us to look for evidence that confirms what we already believe and avoid evidence that contradicts our belief. A fourth bias that affects our perception is pareidolia. Pareidolia is a phenomenon where vague and random stimulus is perceived as being significant. Examples of this include seeing a face on Mars and sightings of the Virgin Mary. I believe it was the combination of these biases accompanied with some form of hallucination which caused individuals to think they saw the risen Jesus. One of the main objections regarding the hallucination hypothesis is that although individuals can hallucinate, this usually isn't found with groups. Groups tend not to hallucinate together. Now although this is generally true, it isn't always the case. For example, there have been group sightings of the Virgin Mary. Now the Gospels, as well as 1 Corinthians, document post-resurrection sightings of Jesus. But what is important to stress is that, 
Although these accounts describe what the group saw and experienced, we don't have the individual testimonies of each member of the group. Instead, we have five individual accounts of what the entire group saw, and some of those accounts were not even firsthand. Using this method does not establish that everyone present saw exactly the same thing. It is completely possible that some may have seen Jesus in white linens with no blemishes, while others may have seen him in dark garments with pierced hands and feet, and others may have only seen him in spirit form. Additionally, from these testimonies, it's not even clear that everyone present even saw Jesus. If some were hallucinating, then they would be the most likely to speak, while those who didn't share the same experience would be less likely to speak up. Many have used the comparison of the Gospel accounts of the Resurrection as a way to demonstrate that the Bible is fallible. However, I'd like to offer a different perspective of these accounts. I would like to suggest that maybe they demonstrate that not everyone saw or experienced exactly the same thing. Let's compare the four accounts. First of all, who do the Gospels say went to the tomb early Sunday morning? Matthew says it was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James. Mark says it was Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome. Luke says it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others. And John says that it was only Mary Magdalene that went to the tomb. Second, what did the individuals see when they arrived at the tomb? Matthew says there was an earthquake and the women saw the angel roll away the stone. But Mark, Luke, and John state that the stone was already rolled away when the women reached the tomb. Third, how many angels does each of the Gospels report as being at the tomb, and where were they? Matthew says it was one angel who met them outside the tomb and told them to go inside. Mark also says it was one angel, but this angel was already inside the tomb. Luke says that two angels appeared to the group while they were inside the tomb. And John says it was two angels that appeared, but these angels appeared much later in the story than the other three accounts. In fact, the angels don't appear until after Peter and John had already been to the tomb. Fourth, who do the women tell about their experience at the tomb? Matthew doesn't explicitly say, but the text implies that they told the disciples. Mark explicitly says that they told no one. Luke says that they told the eleven apostles and the others. And John says they told Peter and John, who then went to the tomb. Fifth, to whom did Jesus first appear? Matthew shows Jesus first appearing to Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James. The most reliable texts of Mark end at verse 8 of chapter 16 and therefore do not discuss this. Luke shows him appearing to two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And John shows him first appearing to Mary Magdalene. Sixth, where did Jesus appear to the collective eleven apostles? Matthew says he appeared to them in Galilee. The most reliable texts of Mark don't address this. Luke says he appeared to them in Jerusalem, and John also says Jesus appeared to them in Jerusalem. It is obvious from reading these accounts that the details differ. The only thing that is really common to all the resurrection stories is that Jesus was seen by individuals after his resurrection. The where, to whom, and how he was seen differ in all four accounts. Now, although the Gospels show the resurrected Jesus being seen in bodily form, we find a different story in 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul lists himself as being one who saw Jesus alongside Peter, James, the other apostles, and a group of 500. It's important to note that he does not distinguish between the way he saw Jesus and the way the others did. From the book of Acts, it is obvious that Paul did not actually see the same Jesus that is claimed by the Gospels. Instead, Paul saw a vision of Jesus. Additionally, 
in the same chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul also equates Jesus' resurrected body with that of future resurrected bodies of Christians. My point in all of this is to show that although there are many claims to have seen Jesus, there is no proof that they all saw exactly the same thing. In fact, the evidence I have presented shows the exact opposite. For the sake of time, I won't address the other two facts, but may do so in a subsequent video. However, I will tell you that there are very plausible explanations for the conversion of both Paul and James. People can be profoundly moved by experiences, even if the events of those experiences are just perceived and not actually real. What I want everyone to take away from this video is that one can concede to all of the facts presented by Logos Apologia and still find a natural explanation to be the most plausible. Natural explanations are always more plausible than supernatural ones. Although Logos Apologia and others may say that their explanation is simpler, this just isn't the case. A supernatural explanation comes with a load of premises that disqualifies it from being a simple explanation. Take care.